chat we had just now on aging, illness, death, separation, and then the reflection on action or karma. That reflects the Buddha's own path. As a young prince, he looked around him, and he had all the pleasures you could imagine that a prince in India would have at that time. But it struck him that all the pleasures he had were going to be subject to aging, illness, and death, and separation. In other words, whatever the story was, it was going to end in suffering. And his question was, is there something you can do so that you can experience aging, illness, death, and separation and not suffer? That was why he went off into the forest, to really look into his mind, because he realized the, the doing here was primarily a mental doing, looking at the mind and seeing why it caused itself to suffer around these things. There might be a way to put an end to that. So when you read the story of his quest, you realize that there were things he began to notice, that habits he had, ways of thinking, ways of focusing his mind, ways of understanding things, that were causing him to suffer, sometimes even just on subtle levels. The question always was, is there another way to do that? Are there other habits? He went all the way to six years of self-torture and realized that that didn't work. And then he thought of a time when he was a young child, or a young man, doesn't say specifically, but when he was younger. He was sitting under a tree and his mind naturally entered concentration. He asked himself, could that be the way? He decided it was worth trying. So he ended the self-torture, ate enough so he can get back the strength the body needed to do concentration practice. And from that developed the mind to the point where he realized that there are other factors in addition to concentration. But all the time he was looking at his actions and the results of his actions, and particularly the way he thought, the way he understood things changing that until he had a complete path that led to something that was free of aging, free of illness, free of death, free of separation. He realized it is possible to experience these things and not suffer, because there is this other dimension in the mind that's not touched by them. And that's where we're meditating, is to find that dimension, or if not to get all the way there, but at the very least to develop in the mind the strengths it needs to, to withstand the fact that aging, illness, death, and separation are going to happen. We don't know exactly how or when, say, death will come. But following the Buddha's example, we know that if you develop good qualities of mind, you're going to suffer a lot less. So here we are developing those qualities. Mindfulness, which is the ability to keep something in mind, in this case reminding yourself that even though the body may age, there may be something in the mind that doesn't age. The Buddha said there is, and one of the things we want to do as we practice is to find if that's true. The same with illness and death. There's a dimension in the mind that he says is free of these things. Well, keep that in mind as a possibility. Don't abandon the possibility. People who abandon that possibility end up really miserable, saying, well, we just got to learn how to take the good with the bad, and then we're all snuffed out at the end. And they're the ones who cause, call Buddhism pessimistic. Actually, the Buddha placed a lot of trust in the potential of human action. Those are things to keep in mind. And then you want to be alert to watch your mind to see what it's doing. That too is a quality that can help you. When pain comes, you have to notice, how do you react to the pain? How do you make the pain worse? The Buddha's image is of a person struck by an arrow and then turns around and shoots himself or herself with another arrow. In other words, there's the physical pain. But then on top of that, there's all the worry and distress around the pain. 
and that hurts a lot more. So you want to be alert to see what ways you're acting and thinking and relating to things that make them worse. And if you see you're doing something to make it worse, okay, then you're ardent. That's the third quality. You're ardent and trying to learn how to drop that habit, no matter how old the habit may be. There's no need to hang on to it. So we learn how to bring the mind to concentration so we can develop these qualities. Because when you're focusing on the breath, these are precisely the things that get strengthened. The ability to keep the breath in mind, the ability to be alert to what's going on with the breath right now, and the quality of ardency to do this well. And we're developing all these qualities as we relate to the present moment, because it's in the present moment where we're going to be meeting aging at some point, age illness at some point, death at some point. They're all going to come right here. So the better you know the present moment, the more likely you are to be able to slip past those things without suffering. It's like knowing that you can very easily get mugged on a particular street corner. So you go down and you check out the corner, see what escape routes there are. Because the escape routes are all right here. They're subtle, which is why we have to spend a lot of time looking right here and developing our powers of alertness and ardency. But all, this all lies within the potential of human beings to do. At the same time, when you develop these qualities, you're going to be less of a burden on other people. One of the hardest things in life is to see someone you love going through the process of aging, illness, and death, particularly as they're approaching death, and there's nothing you can do to help at that point. You see them suffering, but there's nothing you can say, and they may not be able to hear you. They're so overwhelmed by the pain they can't understand. So don't be that person yourself. So when you're developing these strengths, it's not that you're, you're not the only person who benefits. The people around you are going to benefit as well. So this is an important skill. You want to learn how to do it right. So each time you see the mind wandering off, okay, you bring it right back. That's part of ardency. No matter what the thought may be, you just don't continue weaving the thought. Let the fray ends blow in the wind, but you come back. The thing is, you don't have to pull the mind back. As soon as you drop the thought, you're back here with the breath automatically. And then each time you come back, reward yourself with a comfortable breath. And then why stop with one breath? Make it two, three, four. Ask yourself, what would be a particularly gratifying way to breathe? This helps keep you balanced here in the present moment. with a sense of belonging here. Whenever any problem comes up, okay, remember what's worked in the past, what instructions you received that are relevant to what you're doing right now. And at the very least, if you find yourself wandering off, remind yourself, oh, this is not why I'm here. I'm here to stay with the breath to develop these good qualities, because these are the things you'll be able to depend on. And even with other issues, not as serious as aging, illness, and death, anything else that comes up in life where you're worried about the future, you remind yourself, these are the qualities you'll need regardless. Don't be the person who's prepared for one war and suddenly finds himself fighting a different war. Develop the skills that are useful in all wars. And then you're safe all around. There's a concept in Buddhism called refuge. They talk about taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. What it means is you take refuge in their example. The Buddha is someone who found a way to experience aging, illness, and death and not suffer. And the Dharma he taught was the body of instructions that he left behind. This is how you do it. And the Sangha are those who 
followed his instructions and showed that it didn't work just for the Buddha, it works for everybody who puts those instructions into practice. So we look at their example, we try to learn from their example, and then we develop their qualities within us. That's when you get an internal refuge. A refuge that protects you from your own unskillful actions. And also protects you from ideas outside that may say, oh, human beings can't do this. You've known from your experience that human beings can. And finally, there's the ultimate refuge, the refuge of that deathless dimension that can be found in the mind. The Buddha talks about touching it with the mind and also seeing it or touching it with the body. In other words, it's not just an idea. Where you're experiencing your body right now is where you're going to be experiencing the deathless. So everything you need to find is right here. Everything you need to develop, the tools you need to develop to find what's really valuable are right here as well, in a potential form. It's just up to you now to develop them, make them stronger. This is how we protect ourselves from the dangers all around us and even the even bigger dangers inside. All those extra arrows we could be shooting ourselves with. That image of two arrows is actually not really adequate. We get shot by one arrow and then we shoot ourselves with the whole quiver. The meditation is all about learning how not to shoot yourself. Because it's those extra arrows that really hurt, because they go deep into the mind. The external arrow just goes as far as the body. That's the first arrow, and all the other ones go into the mind. So the qualities of mindfulness, alertness, and ardency here, when they're properly applied, show you how you don't have to shoot yourself anymore. And it turns out that suffering that you cause yourself unnecessarily like this is the only suffering that really weighs the mind down when you learn how not to identify with the pains in the body or identify with the body itself. You find that the pain that goes only as far as the body just goes that far. It doesn't seep into the mind. The Thai Johns talk about the perceptions we have, that this body is mine, or the pain is in my leg, and the pain is aimed at me. All these misconceptions we have about the pain, these perceptions, these labels we apply to it, those are the bridge between the body and the mind. And so as you meditate, you're learning how to break the arrows and how to cut the bridge. So the aging, illness, and death go as, only as far as the body, but they don't have to touch your awareness. That's a skill you can develop. That's a skill we're working on right now.